Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I am your host, Brian Scott. Today's episode is dedicated to a vision I have that I want to share with you about the world and its prosperity. And the goal of this episode is to bring prosperity into your life and to fundamentally change the way you look at the world and the prosperity around you. In Joseph Benner's book, Money, he highlights the fact that how can we have this universe where there are so many people struggling with poverty? And that is the goal for us to understand why this is. Is it God's creation that the world in majority is in poverty? In my book, I propose a possible future where everyone is prosperous. Now, oftentimes when I bring this up, I talk to people and ask them the feelings that they have that come up when I mention this idea that everybody could be prosperous. 99.9% will say it's impossible. They base their opinion on the past, on world history, on human nature, on that is the way that things are. 99% of the people will be impoverished and 1% will be wealthy. This extreme has been set up by forces who are largely service to self, but also is a spiritual part of the simulation. And it requires a fundamental change in you. In fact, you are the key in this vision I have of this new world. It's not complicated. It's not hard. Please go back to the many teachings I've had recently on prosperity and spiritual economics and magnetism. I have focused largely on helping you as an individual become prosperous because it is the greatest thing that anyone can give you. Right now, somebody could write you a check for $10,000. It would not help you as much as this vision. This understanding, this idea that you can bring prosperity into your life and for others. For many of you who have followed my channel from the very beginning, you are now prosperous. Put it in the comments because I get comments all the time from people. Messages, people who reach out to me and tell me about the amazing economic success they have in their lives. Because they've followed these principles. And these are not my principles. I'm just a student that's regurgitating what I've learned to you. And so these are universal truths. And many people are finding amazing levels of prosperity and abundance in their lives that they didn't know were possible. They did not believe in in the past. But I have a vision, a new world vision of a world that is prosperous and it just requires one or two people to start a wave of prosperity, a wave of fortune, If you can step outside of yourself in your prosperity now, something amazing can happen. And when you can find agreement with me on this possibility, all it is is a possibility right now, but is a real possibility that I have seen. We can create a world that is so amazing. You know, oftentimes I talk with people that are highly, highly political, that are caught up in the news and they treat politics and the news like it's some sort of sporting event. My guy is not in office, so I'm rooting for the economy to fail, even subconsciously. Oh, I can't have the economy do well because my guy would then be undermined. I can only have the world be prosperous while my guy is in office or my government is in power. Completely ignoring the fact that we're all in this together. And this is not a sporting event. This is life. It doesn't matter who is in power because they don't control what is going to happen in this world. You do. During the course of my podcast, we have engaged in an extensive study of spiritual economics. Repeatedly. We have stressed the point that economic conditions, no matter how dire they appear to be, are in the world, but there. What counts for you, no matter what the stock market is doing or inflation or economic growth, is how you deal with these things in consciousness. 
when you begin to see things from the high perspective of the ever presence of God, you will be in the creative flow of abundance, which will bless your life with sustained affluence. And it will also go forth from you as a prospering influence in the world. This last statement may appear to be more poetry than realism. However, it is a fundamental of the prosperity law that is rarely addressed. Certainly every human heart longs for security and stability in financial affairs, but there is another side of this coin. One who achieves prosperity at once becomes an influence for abundance in the world. Jesus touched on this when he said, I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. John 12, 32. We all live and do business in the world, so it is not easy to maintain a high level of faith. In this time of mass communication, we are all exposed to a steady barrage of doom and gloom. From the Federal Reserve to forecasting economists, who use very convincing business statistics and economic indicators. We would do well to listen to Paul. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your mind from within. Romans 12, 12. It is important to impress yourself often with the great reassurance of the oneness principle, which we repeat here. Wherever substance is at all, the whole of substance must be. And because substance is omnipresent, the whole of universal substance must be present at every point in space at the same time. The teachings of Walter Russell tell us that all of light, all of matter, all of space, all of it is a substance that is God. And it is you. And you are a part of this universal underlying substance this is fundamental spiritual law nothing new i know it sounds cliche or it's kind of out there when you really know yourself as a spiritual being you experience the fulfilling of the law which rushes streams and pours into you in terms of substance and supply and all that is required for success when jesus said i came that they may have life and have it abundantly John 10 10 he was saying that the breakthrough he had made into infinite mind prepared the way for what Emerson called an inlet that may become an outlet to all there is in God it is in this consciousness that we can say many times I have been broke but I have never been poor there may be times when you do not have sufficient money but you can never be separated from the all-sufficiency of God's substance within course not knowing this fundamental spiritual law businesses do fail and people do go hungry if you get caught up in the negativity of the times read the gloomy stories of unemployment and business failures and watch the television documentaries dealing with mass starvation in other parts of the world you could well react in fear and anxiety one minister borrowing the last three words of the classic movie Bridge Over the River Kwai announced as his sermon title, Madness, Madness, Madness. The sermon was a negative forecast of world hunger and despair, pointing to the vague hope of an afterlife and how in some far-off paradise things would be made right. In Orthodox Christian theology, the afterlife is a heaven of the skies where there are golden streets and presumably riches for all, is almost beyond comprehension how this heaven up there became so rooted in the religious thinking of the Western world, especially since Jesus clearly located it. The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Luke 17, 20 through 21. Jesus was not talking about a place in space but a dimension of our minds. And he was saying that within every person, there is limitless life, limitless light, and open access to infinite intelligence. That is the same vision I have now. It's within you. 
lack of any kind in human experience is the result of some sort of obstruction in the free flow of love and the creative process. You cannot begin to understand the prosperity law until you are willing to accept this aspect, which means to take charge of your life. Your consciousness has at the very least contributed to putting you in the place where you happen to be. And the other side of this must also be true. When you begin to assume mastery over your thoughts, you become attuned to an evolution that leads to the unfoldment of the kind of things and experiences you desire. The questions are frequently asked, but is it possible for everyone to enjoy prosperity? Is there not a limit in the universe? That's my question to you. These are logical questions from a purely human perspective. In the field of economics, many of the modern-day quote-unquote experts have been influenced by the Malthusian doctrine propounded by the British economist Thomas Malthus in the 18th and early 19th centuries. And believe me, I know all about this. When I was in debate in college, I read all the Malthus because everybody would use it as an argument in our debates. Malthus stated that population always multiplies faster than its means of subsistence can be made to do. His gloomy prediction for the world of the future, poverty for everyone. Malthus was also a clergyman, but unfortunately he never made the discovery of the oneness, the allness, and the ever-presence of divine substance. And it has influenced our thinking forever, deeply affecting the subconscious of our entire human race. There's no question that we are facing a world in crisis, but let us look at the word crisis as the Chinese see it through the awkward process of translating it from English. They use the symbol for the two words danger and opportunity. Of course, we are facing critical times today and down the road into the future. However, we have the marvelous opportunity to usher in a new earth in which people of awareness will live with what Thoreau calls the license of a higher order of being. We will need to expose our children at a very early age in school to the idea of the spiritual universe and their unique relationship to it. I am not referring to religion. Certainly, I wouldn't want to see the education process confused by the infusion of chauvinistic theological points of view. However, there is a great need to help children to know themselves as whole persons in a whole universe that is one. The very natural next step would be for high school and college students to be challenged with the concept of spiritual economics as we've discussed it. Oliver Wendell Holmes once said, a mind once stretched by a new idea can never go back to its original dimensions. When people have experienced expansion of their awareness of the prosperity principle, they will never be the same then they are ready to play a part in this new earth as it unfolds. The great writer Teilhard de Chardin says, there is now incontrovertible evidence that mankind has just entered upon the greatest period of change the world has ever known. The ills from which we are suffering have had their seat in the very foundation of human thought. But today, something is happening to the whole structure of human consciousness. A fresh kind of life is starting. In the face of such an upheaval, actually shaken by it, no one can remain indifferent, swept along by the tide of affairs. What can we do to see clearly and act decisively? No matter what reactions we may have to current events, we ought first to reaffirm a robust faith in the destiny of man. While economists view the world in crisis with alarm, it is important that here and there New Age thinkers like yourself hold to the vision of the spiritual human being who has always risen to the occasion to draw forth the wisdom and creativity required to take the next logical step in the progress of civilization. In other words, I am hopeful that you will achieve more from this episode than just learning how to demonstrate the wherewithal to pay your bills. I want to see you plugged in to the universal process of growth that you may become a vital part of the spiritualization of the structure of human consciousness. At Amherst College some years ago, a squash was planted in good soil. 
and it had grown to about the size of a person's head. Researchers put a band of steel around it with a harness attached to it so they might discover the lifting power of the squash. They estimated that it might pass 500 pounds. In a month it reached a pressure of 500 pounds. In two months it reached 1,500 pounds, then 2,000 pounds, and they had to strengthen the bands. It finally reached the pressure of 5,000 pounds when it broke the rinds. Upon opening the squash, the researchers were amazed to find it to be a mass of fibers that had developed in the attempt to fight away the obstacles that were hindering the growth of the squash. Further investigation revealed that 80,000 feet of roots had grown, going out in all directions to find help and strength for the fibers which needed substance. This experiment with the squash revealed that due to the very nature of life, the crisis was the opportunity for new growth. It is almost as if because it needed an added power to break the bands, it mobilized every means available to accomplish it. We see this same process at work in nature's evolution. For instance, the giraffe developed a long neck because it needed to reach the edible leaves of the tall trees that grew in its natural habitat. Birds developed their amazing homing instinct because they needed to enable them to migrate from one part of the world to another and safely return home. And when we face life with that robust faith, we can know that we will develop the keys to peace and plenty because we need them. An economic crisis too is the opportunity for growth, just like the squash. Psychologists estimate that not one person in a million is living up to the best which is in him or her. Are you? Are you making the most of your inner resources? When you ride the subway or bus or stand in a crowded elevator, look into the faces of the people around you and try to imagine what life would be like if all these people should suddenly become awake and become their best possible selves. I love to walk around the grocery store and look at everybody and see them as a version of their best and most prosperous self. Do this and then look in the mirror and reflect this same thing on yourself. Can you imagine what your life would be like if you could realize your full potential? This is not to discourage you in the awareness of how far we have to go. The important thing to know is that civilization is just beginning and the best is yet to come. The great wisdom of the ages still lies undiscovered in the depths of humanity's inner self. The great capacity for health and eternal life still lies untapped within our life potential. The key to the kingdom of all self-sufficiency with work and food in abundance for all still lies unused in the depths of our undeveloped faith. Of course, we are faced with very difficult personal as well as worldwide economic challenges. But we know that these are the best of times for we have the opportunity to give birth to a new world. In a book titled The Amazing Crusoes of Lonesome Lake, Ralph Edwards tells of an interesting pioneering experience in the north woods of the Yukon. This family went there with nothing except their bare hands in an experiment to see if they could forge a life for themselves. The author comments in the beginning, all we had was a lot of sheer necessity. In the same sense, the world's economic problems provide us with that sheer necessity, as Browning puts it, to open out a way whence the imprisoned splendor may escape. At this point, you might be wondering about the fact that Jesus said, For you always have the poor with you. Matthew 26, 11. Doesn't this indicate that there will always be pockets of poverty in the world? Jesus, as was his wont, was speaking in a personally symbolic sense. The word poor, as used here, is from the root word that means beggar. He was saying that we live in the world and absorb the limiting beggar thoughts by a process almost like osmosis. The challenge is to transcend the limitations and achieve a higher level of consciousness. Unfortunately, society has accepted this dictum of having the poor always with us, which has given rise to the welfare syndrome. Churches have long engaged in the work to feed and clothe the poor, which is commendable, and I'm all for it. But it is also a cop-out for the church has done little or nothing to help those poor ones to find their own prosperity consciousness, an inlet which may become an outlet for all there is in God. 
How great is the need to help people to know themselves as channels for the flow of God from within, thus to help them throw off the shackles of poverty and move up into the mainstream of affluent living? As we look down the road into the future of civilization, it seems obvious that all religious institutions must set a high priority on the teaching of spiritual disciplines to their followers. People must not only engage in the practice of presence of God, but they must also know that the kingdom of God, which is at hand, is a realm of substance, of light, that is omnipresent and omniactive. Religion must ultimately help all people get into the creative flow of healing, life, guiding intelligence, and limitless supportive light. Eric Butterworth tells a story of a man who had a dream. He believed that economically deprived people could be spiritually rehabilitated and brought up into middle-class experiences. With the cooperation of the New Jersey State Unemployment and Welfare Agencies, he was given the names of 500 chronic unemployables. These were people who had been unemployed for at least two years, during which time they had given up any hope of finding work and had settled into the support of the welfare system. These people were invited to enroll in a two-week crash course in building consciousness, changing their self-image, learning to think positively, learning how to focus their skills and write job resumes. Through the device of role-playing, they learned how to apply for jobs, how to conduct themselves in interviews, and so on. Finally, at the end of the two weeks of concentrated training and already showing signs of new confidence, these people were turned out to seek employment on their own. They were given no leads, nor help of any kind. In a sense, their tutor simply said, okay now, go out and find jobs. Within six months, 80% of the group of 500 people were gainfully employed. That means 400 people had actually been transformed from tax-exhausting welfare clients into tax-paying citizens. The report of this experiment included a careful follow-up of each person in the study. One can imagine this same program being put into effect on a nationwide basis. What a tremendous impact it would have in lessening the welfare load and increasing tax revenues. It would actually turn the nation's economy around in 30 days. The carefully documented report was called the Patterson Plan. You might wonder, what became of it? Nothing which may well indicate that at least a part of the problem is the inertia of the whole system, which is locked into the you-always-have-the-poor-with-you syndrome, the belief in the world that we can't resolve the issues of the poor, they will always be there. The system was threatened by a plan that promised to relieve and possibly eliminate much poverty. This very illumining research project clearly revealed that poverty is corrected not by doling out money, but by helping people to change their self-image and achieve a rich mentality. Charles Fillmore, who is amazing, we've read him several times on the podcast, once said, it is a sin to be poor. This is not judgmentally viewing the disadvantaged people of our society on a karmic basis. The word sin to a student of metaphysics, as described by Neville Goddard, is missing the mark or some others refer to it as the frustration of potentiality. It is closely related to the Anglo-Saxon word sign, which was an archery term, meaning missing the target. Thus, sin is missing the mark of perfection, a block in the process of projecting one's potential divinity. Poverty as a collective condition can only be corrected by helping people one by one to stir up the gift of God within them. This is not to say the poor are responsible for the condition of poverty, but it is saying that every person must take charge of his or her own life. The experience of poverty in any life is the personal opportunity to awaken to a new consciousness and reveal a new order of life. People can begin with what they have and do what they can right where they are, even if all they have is a lot of sheer necessity. But if they will affirm that robust faith in the universe of order, they will experience a new consciousness that will guide their hands, direct their footsteps, and put words in their mouths in a great process of transformation from indigence to affluence. The cynic will say, you're dreaming. In any way, there are no jobs to be had. At this point, we desperately need the wisdom of Jesus as he said, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. John 7.24 He also said, I, when I am lifted up from the earth, 
will draw all men to myself, John 12, 32. As one person changes his or her level of thought, the consciousness of the whole changes to that degree. One person gets off welfare and begins to even to gear his or her thinking towards productive work. There's a rippling effect through the entire economy of the nation, even of the world. True, the influence is small, certainly imperceptible, but it is real. It is much like the phenomenon described by astrophysicists. If one person waves a hand, he or she sets off a rippling effect in the atmosphere that has an effect on the farthest star. So as one or two persons here and there across the land begin to think and work and be prosperous in abundance, something special happens. People become more secure and begin to purchase things. Businesses begin to expand and thus take on more workers. Government pays out less and takes in more taxes, having the luxury of deciding whether to reduce taxes or to embark on new programs or whatever. But in either case, leading to economic health for the nation, which in turn becomes an affluence for prosperity for every person and the world. It all can come down to one or two people. And though it's imperceptible at the beginning, the wave can grow. The exciting part of this cyclical process of prosperity in the world is that it has its genesis in the modest influence of two or three persons agreeing in a consciousness of prosperity and creativity. You and I can agree on it and we can change the world right now. So agree with me on prosperity. Just one person who changes his thoughts, becoming alive with the idea of the oneness of the God, substance, and light, staking his claim for prosperity and success in the world, not only begins to experience abundance in his or her life, but also becomes a powerful influence for prosperity in the world. It is a total switch on the old cop-out that when the economy improves, my situation will be better. It is the great new conviction that when I move forward towards prosperity, the whole economy improves with me. Perhaps we should think in terms of blessing the economy of the world by singing, let there be prosperity on earth and let it begin with me. The words are not musically adaptable, but the idea can start a chain of power that will begin a definite move toward actualizing our new world vision. Just think what this new concept means. The old theology taught, or at least strongly implied, that it is a sin to be prosperous. Thus, there have been often subdued feelings of guilt associated with the desire for or the experience of abundance. In our new earth vision, it is turned completely around. The righteous or right use of laws of spiritual economics is a powerful influence for prosperity in the world. Of course, on the practical side, it means a great renaissance of self-reliance. Where the individual does not look to others or to government for the means of her prosperity. She does what she can with what she has right where she is. She thus consciously becomes a respective channel for the flow of light. And in this person and those like her, we witness a hopeful return of the self-made person. Another recent significant study dealt with the problem of inflation. Of course, we hear about inflation all the time. Can't escape from it. Your gas prices are going up. It, this study fixed the major responsibility on productivity and more specifically on worker attitudes. The report admitted that there could be no quick fix, but that a start could be made by improving personal attitudes of every worker in the marketplace. We hear much about recessions and depressions as if we are referring to some great monster that has the world in its clutches. The fact is we have been in the midst of a great depression of worker attitudes for years. In recent years, there's been a spiraling upward sweep through the industry and its workers of greater profits for inferior products and higher wages and less hours and less and less productivity in those hours. The time is ripe and rotten ripe for change. If there could be a mass turnaround in worker attitudes and productivity with people caught up in the ideal of work as the opportunity to release their innate potential, there would be a great reversal of economic lows and inflationary trends in a matter of weeks. Many people are choosing to work at home. That's a wonderful thing. Choose to create your reality exactly as you want to be. Maybe there's a little period of time where there's struggle for work, but there's always a wonderful change that will occur when you choose to create your own reality. 
Thus, it can be seen that the solution to many of our economic problems can be simple. It's not easy, but it is simple. Simple from the standpoint that it is not complex. It is not easy because it depends on people realizing that the heart of the problem is not out there somewhere, but in the consciousness of each person. The sincere student of truth will look in a mirror and say, it is high time that you stopped being a part of the problem and become part of the solution. The solution is a collective consciousness of the ever-presence of God's light. When you think abundance, even begin to experience the free flow of abundance in your life, you are a vital part of that which makes for prosperity for all people. Perhaps we should look back and see how we got to the present state of affairs. Our American forefathers were not unlike the followers of Moses in their flight from Egypt. Our people wandered in deserts far wider than Sinai. Together we have built scores of cities grander than Jerusalem. We've erected hundreds of temples finer than Solomon's. And we've risen to a place of world prestige and power and influence. But by right of consciousness, for that is the divine law. But we are seeing a change. Much of our influence in the world is waning. Our great cities are rotting from within and our temples have lost their voices and their influence for good. The Hebrew prophet spoke almost as one voice in proclaiming that prosperity and righteousness are closely linked. Not the righteousness of the Pharisees who made a display of piety, but the right use of divine law in thought and in practice. To put it in the simplest terms, it means turning from a philosophy of in gold we trust back to the old-fashioned ideal of in God we trust. Perhaps the simple solution is to turn away from rampant materialism, which is a part of this spiritual quandary. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put them into a bag with holes. Haggai 1.6 Doesn't that sound like a comment about today's high cost of living and the difficulty through inflation of keeping up with price increases? Those words were uttered by Haggai over 2,500 years ago. He was talking about how to cope with a sick economy. How better could you describe inflation than carrying your wages in a bag with holes? Haggai's answer to the problem of the economy, go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house. In a personally symbolic sense, this says to go within in a time of silence and get a renewed awareness of God as your resource and then go about your business affairs in the strong consciousness of the omnipresence of substance. As students of new consciousness thinking, I challenge you to take hold of this prosperity principle of the omnipresence of light and substance of the oneness of all. Become a part of a new worldwide epidemic of faith in the conviction there is no need for poverty or lack anywhere. Believe that you are always in the presence of limitless prosperity and wealth, which you form and shape and release through your belief. Keep the high watch of truth by knowing that wherever you are and whatever you experience, you are a part of the flow of the God power. And remember, the substance of God, the light of God is not simply spending money, but that which gives value to everything you have, everything you do, everything you are. It is ideas. It is creativity. It is guidance. It is health and vitality. Listen to the words again of Charles Fillmore as he sends out a clarion call for a new earth vision. In the new era, now at its dawn, we shall have a spirit of prosperity. The principle of the universal substance will be known and acted upon and there will be no place for lack. Supply will be more equalized. There will will not be millions of bushels of wheat stored in musty warehouses while people go hungry. There will be no overproduction or underconsumption or other inequities of supply, for God's substance will be recognized and used by all people. Men will not pile up fortunes one day and lose them the next, for they will not fear the integrity of their neighbors. Is this an impractical utopia? The answer depends on you. Just as soon as you individually do your part, and quickening the consciousness of the whole economy. The great new earth vision that Mr. Fillmore is talking about is now. The kingdom of God is at hand. Wherever you may be, 
You are an unborn possibility of limitless life, infinite intelligence, unlimited light, and yours is the privilege and the responsibility of giving birth to this new earth. If you're not demonstrating supply in an orderly and affluent way of life, you are frustrating your own potential and you are also part of the problem of society. It is important for you as a spiritual being to experience prosperity in every area of your life. You should be healthy. You should experience a life of love and fulfillment and you should manifest harmony in all your affairs leading to prosperity and success. But remember, the consciousness of the earth as a whole, which certainly includes your next door neighbor, will be influenced for good or ill by the kind of thoughts that rule your mind and manifest in your world. So for the sake of humanity as a whole, as well as for your own experience, think of the ever-present light and substance of all, and then think of prosperity Think of plenty for all. Of course, the world is so big and the problem of poverty and hunger so widespread, so continuous throughout history that you're thinking, what can I do? How can I have any kind of influence on such a gigantic need? I'm only one person. Canon Farrar has the answer. Let him speak directly to you. I am only one, but I am one. I can't do everything, but I can do something. What I can do, I ought to do. And what I ought to do, by the grace of God, I will do. So I want you to leave this episode with a belief in your power. You have worked on these principles. Maybe you're struggling with your debts, whatever it is. And you've had money come to you. You've had money come to you in unusual and unexpected ways. Maybe it was a little bit. Maybe it was a lot, but you've started to see the power of your mind to create reality, especially if you followed this podcast on my channel and you tried some of these techniques out. Now that you've started to see this flow of energy and money coming into you and going out, now you have to step back and think of the bigger world. What are you making money for? Is it to serve yourself? To have 20 cars? 50 mansions. That's certainly possible because all things are possible for you. Or is it to serve others and to bring prosperity to everyone? Your prosperity doesn't take prosperity away from anyone else. You are an example of the flow of harmony of the God power. When people see the example that you give, they will find prosperity. See prosperity in others. Imagine it for them. Teach them. Spread the word. I promise you, you will make a difference. And together, just the several hundred people that are watching this video right now, just us, we can change the universe not just the world. We can change the world and the whole universe will see what we did. It only takes a few of us working together in harmony, imagining prosperity for the world. So sit with me right now and I want you to take a few moments with me and I want you to imagine the world as prosperous. No man is left behind. Everyone is wealthy, beyond their wildest dreams, happy, prosperous, in the perfect way working together in harmony. Everyone is well clothed, well fed and housed perfectly. All of the sins, the missed marks, the mistakes in thought, the mistakes in consciousness are wiped away. All know the truth and all know the power of their imagination and together all imagine a prosperous and wonderful future. Can you see it? Can you feel it? Believe it. Join me. Powerful fourth density technologies. 
images designed to magnetize and broadcast. Now available at newearth.art. Welcome to the Reality Revolution.